So Mexico City is home, the, the broader area, to about 20 million people. It's the eighth largest urban economy in the world. Uh, and nine out of ten Mexican, of the top ten Mexican exporters has their um, headquarters in the city. 70% of all foreign direct investment in Mexico is made in Mexico City. So it's really you know, at the heart of, uh, of a developing continent right now. On the back of that, there's been a huge amount of development uh, in the city over the past five to ten years. To give you a sense of scale, there's currently about twice as much real estate being developed in Mexico City as there is in Manhattan. Uh, rents are peaking at the top end of the market at around $40 per square foot per year, about half that in Manhattan, but closing the gap. So much of that development is centered around Piso de la Reforma, which you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, this lies just next to Chapultepec Park, um, and the, the projects that I'm going to talk about today are really clustered around that park. Um, and I should say, uh, we've got a, a couple of the architects in the audience um, Benjamin Romano, who's responsible for Toro Reforma in the top left-hand uh, side. The, the next building you can see in the bottom left was with uh, Lego Rogers, a joint venture between Richard Rogers and Legoretta and Legoretta. That's the Toro BBVA Bancoma for the bank. Um, the, the next you can see with Talaji Architects, also here uh, today, uh, is Reforma 509. Very, very slender tower, which you can see uh, in, to the left of the image yeah. Yeah. Um, the next one here is, uh, is called um, uh, 24 Pedregal and has this very distinctive cantilevered shape. Moving on to um, Manaka, and both of these are with Teodor Gonzalez Leon. Uh, on the top right, you can see the newest addition to this cluster of buildings, which is Reforma 336. So the talk today is really about the, the complex challenges of delivering high-quality, world-leading uh, office space in a, in a very, very dense urban environment, uh, which has got a number of key constraints associated with it. So Mexico City, I mentioned earlier, is home to about 20 million people. Um, Mexico, Mexico became an independent republic in 1823 with Mexico City as its uh, capital. However, the city actually dates back much, much longer. It was originally settled in about 1325, and so it's very dense. Just to give you a sense of scale, uh, that's the blue, the blue dot there is enlarged in the top right-hand corner of the, uh, of the screen, and we'll, we'll zoom in again, and you can see uh, the, the sites that I mentioned earlier. So already, this is, this is really a key constraint for any development in the central business district. There are not very many uh, underdeveloped or undeveloped sites. So typically the buildings that we work on with our collaborators um, have to make use of small parcels of land um, in uh, areas which have a lot of historic significance. So a, a really good example of this is, is Torre Reforma, which sits practically above or on top of uh, an existing hacienda, a uh, historic house. And this was one of the key drivers in the development of this site, which has a very distinctive architectural form uh, with a sort of a right angle of concrete shear walls at the, at the back of the building with a completely open um, glazed facade on the front, which is enabled by uh, hanging, hanging braces, um, which you'll see a bit more of later. In order to make that possible, um, at the instigation of Benjamin Romano and with uh, colleagues at DTEC and, and local professors, um, Arup had to move uh, this house 18 meters out of position uh, and then put it back again intact. So great lengths have been uh, gone to in order to preserve the fabric of the city that we're working in uh, whilst enabling this, this world-leading uh, building to to make the most of the site and to exploit the views of, uh, of, the, of the park that I mentioned earlier. Similar challenges were, were faced at the other side of the park um, with uh, 24 Pedregal. This building also um, overhangs uh, a historic site. Uh, the cantilever that you can see on, on the left is, is 75 meters. 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we achieved that whilst also delivering a very, very efficient building and one which is already occupied. On the right-hand side, you can see another, a lead into another constraint in, in Mexico City, which is related to uh, planning. Um, unlike many cities in North America and Europe, um, local codes there require a minimum number of car parking spaces, which is quite close to almost one per person in the building. And this creates a huge demand for space in, in the buildings uh, for, for parking. Um, consequently, many of these buildings have very, very deep basements. The one you can see on the screen here is 16 levels deep, um, founded into relatively firm ground at, at this point. So it creates this sort of uh, topology almost like icebergs, uh, where what you see above ground is really only about uh, 70 to 80 percent of the, of the gross area of the building. So these are the, the models, the, the engineering models of, those, of the four towers we're looking at today. But this also creates an opportunity. So the, ne the next constraint is really about uh, shaky ground or earthquakes. And I think you'll all know that Mexico City um, is very prone to, to devastating earthquakes. Part of the, um, part of the reason that it's uh, so badly affected by earthquakes is to do with the soil. So Mexico City is actually about 300 kilometers from the, from the Pacific, um, where the Cocos Plate is subducting below the North American plate. So it's quite a long way. Um, however, um, waves propagating from, from that subduction zone where the, the tectonic plate is forced underneath the, the continent travel through relatively firm ground to Mexico City where it encounters a, a lake basin which is uh, akin to jello or jelly and can amplify the ground motions about 40 or 50 times. So even motions that are very, very distant can lead to um, devastating earthquakes at the surface in the city. You'll, you'll be familiar with the 1985 earthquake, which was an 8.1 uh, magnitude event uh, on that subduction zone that led to an uh, estimated 10,000 deaths and 250,000 uh, people were, were made homeless. A lot of this, again, was due to that amplification and the, and the soft shaking of the soft ground. So using the topology that um, is almost enforced because of the requirement for parking, uh, we're able to exploit this to minimize the effect of amplification through the soft soil. Um, to put it simply, if, if you think about a bowl of jello uh, and you shake it, it moves a lot less at the bottom than it does at the top. So taking your building and, and founding it into that stiffer material can have a huge, huge benefit. However, codes don't really provide a means of doing that. And so we have to turn to advanced analysis in order to justify to the local um, authorities that we're delivering a building that will perform in the spirit of the code. So we, we, we go through a process called soil structure interaction analysis where we mo model not just the building, but often the, uh, the building alongside it, the basement of the building and the adjacent basements, and also the soil beneath. Um, it's an example of this model for uh, Reformer 509 on the screen at the moment. We then take recordings of, of real historic earthquakes and how they move the ground. And they're scaled so that they represent the, the real hazard in Mexico City at our specific site. And we then shape the model. And this allows us to understand uh, not what the code thinks will happen to, to our building, but what will happen in a, in a real event. So I think if we could just play the, the video. So this is for um, Torah BBVA. And you can see, um, just, we're just showing the structure here for simplicity. But you can see the building moving as the earthquake passes through. And, and what we're doing here is looking at the way energy is absorbed uh, in those elements that, that light up. And that's a key feature of protecting these buildings in an earthquake, is finding ways to absorb energy uh, in, in a manner that enables the architectural form uh, and makes the most of the views available uh, in these very prestigious sites. So we could go to the next one, thank you. So the basements, as I say, ironically become a really key part of delivering uh, a very efficient form above ground. And uh, the construction approach varies depending on the, the very varying soil conditions that we find. So just three kilometers between these buildings, we have material which is uh, stiff enough that we can uh, excavate, excavate from above and just use ground anchors to retain a shotcrete wall. 
Uh, and then back on Reformer, we have to excavate uh, diaphragm walls with the, with the grabber that you can see in the, in the top of the, uh, the image there. So the, the challenge really, as I've, I've, as I've mentioned, is, uh, is taking these very, very tight sites. The, the, uh, the desire from the bold developers that we work with and, and bold clients to have excellent world-class buildings and provide structural solutions that, that enable it. A lot of this comes down to detailing, and I think it's something that's often overlooked in buildings. People appreciate them from a, from a distance. Um, they see icons and figures, and you know, there's a lot of imagery ar around the iconography of tall buildings on the stage. And we also interact with them at a very human scale. But, but in between, there are uh, engineering and architectural details that enable those forms to function. And so this next section really takes a key detail from each of the four buildings and uh, will explain how it um, enabled the, the delivery of that structure. So the first one you, you saw in the animation earlier is the seismic fuse for, for BBVA. And this is a little bit analogous to an electrical fuse in a, in a circuit. Um, it's about providing protection in a defined part of the system and protecting, uh, and, and protecting the rest of it. So in a large earthquake, as you saw in that animation, this system racks over. It's called an eccentrically braced frame. Um, the, the link that you can see in the middle is designed to be, to, to be plastic, to deform and to absorb energy, and thereby controlling the forces that are um, put into the rest of the system and protecting the building. This is uh, the largest eccentrically braced frame in the world. Uh, and it creates a very, very efficient system by putting all of the seismic resisting system on the, on the perimeter. So there's no structural core for this building, which means that we can drop out um, the, the core at the, at the base, again, to make flexible spaces for, for the bank um, and for the car parking that I mentioned earlier. Again, we turn to detailed nonlinear analysis to justify this. This is not defined in any code, and so we have to rely on a combination of testing um, and analysis to, to really push the boundary of what's possible. These things are about uh, 0 0.9 meters, so 900 meter, uh, millimeters, which is about three feet deep, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, Mexico City has very long duration ground motions. Uh, the earthquakes go on for a long time, and so we have to think about the potential for fatigue, and again, that is um, controlled and tested using numerical models and benchmarked against physical test marks test results. So here you can see uh, that detail in action. And the architect, uh, Richard Rogers and Legoretta, worked very closely with us to express the form. And that's a, that's a kind of a recurring theme in some of these buildings. So at Reformer 509, um, we face similar challenges. However, the, the site here is even, is even tighter. It's 25 meters across, and the building is about 200 uh, 230 meters tall, um, so not quite as slender as some of our um, buildings in New York, but certainly getting up there, and seismic as well, which presents additional challenges. Um, again, the, the architects wanted to maximize the views of the, of the park, and uh, we developed a, uh, an unusual bracing approach, which uses just a single direction of bracing, um, restrained at every level over a three-story module. And this reduces the density of the bracing and creates much sort of more open facades, again, looking back towards the park. Similarly with BBVA, this is not codified. And so um, working with researchers at the University of California and using, uh, again, nonlinear finite element analysis, we we're able to justify that this system performs uh, in the same manner as a much, much more conventional braced frame but without the need for the dense bracing that you uh, would associate with those kind of systems. So from a small scale of bracing to a really giant one. Um, oh, sorry, that's the next one. Uh, this, is a, this is an intermediate scale of bracing. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, we had to deal not just with a, a historic house uh, on this site, but again, a really prestigious location which looks directly over the monument to the 200th anniversary of independence in the city and on to Chapultepec Park. So uh, this, this system uses a double V brace uh, in two different planes, which 
were developed in conjunction with, with Benjamin Romano, who's chosen to express them to, I think, accentuate the, the modularity of the, of the building. You can see that this has required very, com well, uh, uh, in the end, a simple detail, but a very refined um, uh, gasset plate with multiple braces, well, four braces in, in multiple planes, all coming together uh, at the floor level. I should say that this also results in no columns on the, uh, on the facade, which uh, is leading, I think, to this being one of the premier rental um, properties in the city. Again, uh, significant reliance on beyond code justification to enable this kind of system in a highly seismic zone. And this, this project is, uh, is, is now topped out. This is about six weeks ago. Um, and the facade, actually, I was there last week, the facade is now uh, largely in place. So really an iconic um, building at the, uh, at the entrance to, to Reforma. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we've also used braces on, a, on an absolutely giant scale in the city. So this is a 75-meter cantilever, um, and what you can just about make out in that image, uh, if you look very closely, is the trace of a, a, a V um, which almost reflects symmetrically the, the cantilever. Um, so this is really the key, the key diagram for, for this building. The, the floors um, underneath and to the left of that V are suspended from, from the V brace, which does a number of things. Um, from a structural perspective, you can think about it like a seesaw. It, it balances the building and makes it incredibly efficient. But from an architectural perspective, it's also freed up the, uh, the bottom levels. There are, there are no columns where this meets the ground. Uh, and so, again, with a, with a very key location alongside the park, this has freed the architect to uh, deliver flexible space and, and great views. I mentioned that it was also very efficient. When, when we joined the project, there was an existing scheme which used a diagrid. Um, and without that balance, um, the, the structural tonnage was, was significantly higher and performing... Uh, less well, it wasn't as stiff. So with these big strategic moves, we've been able to transform the way the building performs. And this is a, a recent photo of the building uh, just as it opened. And you can, you can get a sense to the left of that huge glazed area with, with a, with a column-free lobby um, at, on the park side. So you know, there's lots of kind of flash images of, of analysis, but really at the end of the day, that the purpose of all of that is to de deliver great buildings, but also ones that, that make sense financially. And so each of them, th there's a story behind each of them in terms of uh, how we've managed to combine the, the, you know, the great collaboration with our architectural colleagues uh, and some smart thinking to, to make big impacts on the bottom line. So for Toro Reformer, we were able, um, along with Benjamin Romano, to remove 181 um, very large diameter caissons from the, from the project, saving an estimated $14 million. Uh, on, on Pedregal, the, the shifts that I talked about earlier, taking out the diagrid and implementing the, the balance V-brace, uh, reduced the total steel tonnage by 100 kilograms per, per meter squared. So really significant changes in the construction cost of the tower. The, the analytical approach that we took to, to BBVA um, reduced the seismic forces by 33%. Um, without doing that, this building simply wouldn't have been feasible. The, the ground is just not good enough uh, to, to, to deal with the forces that a pure code approach would, would have required. So obviously you can turn this into to monetary value as well, and we, we're in the order of about $10 million of, uh, of savings associated with that. Um, and Reformer 509, um, Optimization uh, using a bespoke analysis package that we wrote for, for this tower um, allowed us to reduce the, um, the, the steel tonnage by 500, sorry, 50 kilograms per meter squared. And on a site which, as I said earlier, is only 25 meters across, dealing with very, very large seismic demands. So all of these projects, you know, I think on the theme of global interchanges, um, were really only possible through collaboration. Um, Without exception, we've worked hand-in-hand hand with the architects uh, and the developers and clients to deliver what we believe are very, very integrated buildings. So I'd just like to end by saying thank you uh, to our collaborators and particularly to those in the room today.